Okay, so today we have a very interesting first reading and a very interesting gospel, both of which um, briefly require an explanation. Otherwise, uh, there seems to be a little bit of insanity going on here. This, this king who invites people to the wedding, they don't come, so he slaughters and burn, burns their town, and then he invites randomers in and then kicks one out for not having the right clothes on when he wasn't invited in the first place. Anyway, it just makes the, whole, the king look very unpredictable. And then our first reading, uh, Jephthah, who uh, says if he wins this battle, he says to the Lord who wins this battle that he will sacrifice the first person that he meets when he goes home. So he goes home and outruns his little daughter. And now he feels bound to sacrifice her. Okay, so so this this requires a whole lot of explanation. Now, it'll, I think it can be done briefly. I'll do my best. So what makes this first reading even more difficult to understand is it starts with the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. This is in the book of Judges. The Spirit of the Lord came on him. So now you'd imagine, okay, if the Spirit of the Lord has come upon him, now everything he's going to do is, is blessed, anointed, inspired, right? Wrong. That's, that's the, the interesting thing. So Jephthah was one of the judges. In the, this, he's in the book of Judges, and he is a judge, so a leader of the people. But what we see here is that uh, as a judge... The Spirit of the Lord is upon him in the sense that he has a responsibility to guide the people and the Lord will give him the grace he needs. Okay. Does that mean that the Lord will endorse everything he does? No. So there's a difference there. There's a difference between the Holy Spirit coming upon you and you having the Spirit within you and the Lord endorsing everything you do. Now, I was just talking to a lady recently and... Um, well, maybe a, an example that comes to mind pretty quickly could be like within the church, right? So just because a person is ordained doesn't mean that everything they do is okay. Uh, obviously, we have very tragic stories in, in our history of, of where this has gone wrong. So just because you're ordained doesn't mean everything you do is holy. Doesn't mean just because you're a sister and take vows doesn't mean that everything you do is, is gentle and kind and loving and builds people up. Okay, so just because we have the Holy Spirit or a special anointing, doesn't mean that the Lord endorses everything we do. But we can actually take it a step further as well, because it's always easy to point the finger and say, yeah, them people over there, they need to be different, they need to change, they made mistakes. You've been anointed. You've been anointed in virtue of baptism. You have received the Holy Spirit. All of the baptized have received the Holy Spirit. So we have received this very particular grace of being dwelled in by the Holy Spirit. All of us. So just because the Holy Spirit lives in, it, in us, does that mean that all of our actions are, are holy? That, that they're all virtuous? That they're all perfect? No, it should. It should mean that the Holy Spirit lives in me, therefore I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore all that I do should be, should be holy, should be inspired, should be anointed. But it's not. That's what this, this reading is pointing out. This is an example like, of what not to do. Just because it's in the scripture, in, 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 in the Bible, doesn't mean that it's an example of what to do, how to behave. No, what we have here is an example of what not to do. The spirit of the Lord is upon Jephthah, and he has been given the command to defend his people, and actually also to oust the Amorites. We won't go into that. So that, that, that he was called to do that. He was not called to make this vow to the Lord that the, if I win, the first person I meet when I go home, I'll sacrifice them. God never asked him to do that. That's not, that what, it does not say the Spirit of the Lord required this of him. No, this was a 100% Jephthah. So even though Jephthah is a leader of the people, a judge, he doesn't know God. He doesn't know him. How absolutely tragic that is that a leader of the people so a, a leader of God's chosen people and therefore someone who should represent God to the people someone who should uphold his law doesn't know God now again like this maybe the immediate example that comes to mind is within the church yeah if, if if priests or religious have fallen short of the mark they're supposed to represent God they're supposed to be his merciful and tender face. They're supposed to teach the truth. They're supposed to courageously lead the people to heaven. And if they don't do that, the, the, the consequences are horrific. The consequences are absolutely disastrous. 
So when a person is in a position like this and doesn't know the heart of God, in a position of influence in the church, and doesn't actually know God, the consequences are, are awful. They are disastrous. But it isn't just priests and religious who have this, this role or this responsibility. I mean, who's going to teach the, the faith to, to children? Well, generally speaking, their parents. Their parents are the primary educators, not just in civil education or whatever it's called, normal education, but also as regards the faith. If I see dad pray, if I see mom pray, that's going to be an absolutely powerful example to me, more powerful than whatever I learn at school. So all of us have received this anointing, and therefore all of us are called to maybe a much higher standard than, than we were aware of, because we represent God. And just because we have received the Spirit doesn't mean that the Lord endorses everything we do. We choose to sin. And yes, thank God we have confession, but we actually need confession because we keep choosing to do things that aren't anointed. So not knowing the heart of God, even though, we're, even though we should, even though we've received all the grace we need, it can happen that we don't know the heart of our God. I would actually argue that that's very, very common. I would say that it's the overwhelming majority of people uh, who call themselves Catholic, actually might find it difficult to know the heart of God at all. To know, like, to know his mercy, to know his tenderness. Now, I'm not saying to know him uh, in his fullness, because obviously he's infinite and we can't know him completely. But so many people, even, even people of a certain age, they'll come to me like fear, so, so fearful, so, so uh, yeah, afraid of meeting God, who they feel is this big just judge with a big book who's going to open it up when they find themselves at the pearly gates and say, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and when you were 12 years old, you do that. And I said, but you've confessed that. You've confessed it. It's gone. It's gone. Let the Lord be your father. Let God be your father. Allow his mercy to seep into your heart. That is never an endorsement to do whatever you want, but believe in his mercy. Believe that when he says your sins are forgiven, that they're forgiven. It's not your sins are forgiven, but I'm actually never, ever, ever going to forget them. And as soon as I meet you, I'm going to remind you of that time when you were. No, that's not God. So we have this king who has a wedding feast for his son. Okay, so huge preparations, all fantastic, all the food laid out. And those who were invited basically couldn't be bothered. They couldn't be, but they didn't have much to do. All, to, all I'm asking you to do is turn up. Right, you don't even have to do anything. And a little detail there is those who were invited, apparently, I, I heard this explanation, uh, that when one came to a, a Jewish wedding, the garment, your, your wedding, your uh, attendee's garment was provided for you. So it was a simple kind of a shawl thing that you threw over, but it was provided for you. So you didn't actually have to do anything. You didn't even have to dress up. You just had to turn up and the meal is there and the garment is there. And the couple are there. There's this great wedding feast. So they were invited, and one, um, yeah, they decided he'd go off and do his bit of farming, another to his business, and they seized his servants. So those who were inviting them, you're inviting me to a wedding. How dare you invite me to a wedding? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> it's insane. It's absolutely crazy. They seized the servants, maltreated them, and killed them. You see, so you see the level of, of degeneration that we're at here, right? <laughs> they're only being invited to a wedding. And their response is to kill those inviting them. It's absolutely insane. Like, this is off the Richter scale crazy. So you can imagine the king saying, what on earth, what's, what is going on here? Like, Everything is, I have a good thing ready for you. The garments are ready for you. You just have to walk. And once you get here, all, all is good. Now, fast forward to what this analogy obviously means, heaven. So God is saying, I have a place prepared for you. I have the garment ready. That's the, 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 the washing clean of our sins that we get in baptism. So we're washed clean. We're ready if, if we wish. It's all there for us. All we have to do, all we have to do is turn up. 
And what does that mean? That means well, on a daily basis, I have to turn up to my prayer time. On a, daily, on a weekly basis, I have to turn up for Mass. All you have to do is get into a car, drive. No more than probably 10 minutes for the vast majority of us in Ireland. There'll be a church somewhere within 10 minutes. All you have to do is turn up and you will receive Jesus in the Eucharist. Or turn up for confession. So all you have to do is just turn up. Everything, everything is all, all the hard work is done. It's all ready. So now you understand why uh, the king reacts so badly. It's just the, 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 as I say, the insanity of, of everything going on here. So the servants went out and they invited everyone uh, into, into the feast. And so the wedding hall is full and away we go. So how did you get in here, says he, to a random punter? Now I just, I always, this is, excuse my, my mental image here, but this is how I, I play it out. But I, can just, I just imagine this wedding feast and they went to the streets to invite people in. So, I mean, these people, chances are then they're, they're, they're homeless, like they've been invited in from the street. So I just imagine this, this homeless guy with a chicken drumstick there just chawing away and listening to the beats, you know, the music. And they're all dancing out there on the dance floor. And then the king comes over saying, you, sir, how did you get in here? You've no wedding garment. And you can imagine him going, of course I've no wedding garment. I'm homeless. <laughs> like, this is my wardrobe. What you're looking at is my wardrobe. And then they kick him out and bind him hand and foot and throw him out. Uh, into the place of his weeping and grinding of teeth. Again, we always have to protect the image of God as a loving father. What on earth is happening here? Again, the wedding garment is provided. All you have to do is put it on. The mercy of God is available to us. All we have to do is accept it, but we do have to accept it. As in, we don't have much to do, but the little we have to do, we have to do it. As in, God provides his mercy. But I can say, Lord, actually, yeah, I'm grand. Actually, I don't need your mercy. If you say you don't need God's mercy, then how on earth are you going to get into heaven? Are you going to earn heaven yourself? That's really, really dangerous. Really dangerous. It's actually a heresy. Uh, it's called the Pelagian heresy, where we believe we can save ourselves through our own good actions. So we can't save ourselves. We're saved by the mercy of God. So if I say, Lord, I don't need your mercy, I don't need to put on this garment, well, then you can't be in heaven because you won't save yourself. You can't. You're just not able to. So the, the, the king isn't being unreasonable here. The man, the garment was available to him. Jews would have known this. That's why Jesus doesn't explain it. The garment was available to him. He doesn't put it on. He chooses not to put it on. And so then he, he can't be at the feast. So what do we have here? It's about knowing the heart of God. And even though we have received the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean that the Lord endorses everything we do. So we can be called to serve the Lord and yet actually not know him. And that, that, is, a, that is a great tragedy, to be called to serve but not know him. And this is something we, we must undo. It's something we must repair. That those who are serving the Lord, that the next generation, that priests, religious, families, that this Lord that they're called to serve, this Lord that, that, that is, is the head of their faith, their, their, their religion, that they actually know him. Otherwise, what on earth are we doing? So we pray for this renewal of the church, the renewal of the faith the renewal of the priesthood. We pray, Lord, for the renewal of our country, that we may know you, that we may love you, and that we may serve you. Amen.